Hello, my name is Michael Green and I welcome you to the 17th episode of my podcast Historians in Conversation, which is hosted by the University of Lodz in Poland. My guest today is Professor Mary Wisner Hanks from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and she is renowned for her work on women and gender in the early modern period in Europe and globally. I will be talking today to Professor Wisner Hanks about her career about her motivation to study history and how she got to study history at the first place. I welcome Professor Mary Wisner Hanks to my podcast. Hello Mary and welcome to my podcast. I'm very glad to have you here today. Thanks. I always ask my guests about their background, where they come from, their family, friends, uh, childhood, their school. So could you perhaps tell me a little bit about it? I think this helps to better understand the person, especially a person that becomes a renowned academic. Oh, that's hard to think about my childhood because I didn't anticipate it when I, when I was a child that I'd end up doing what I was doing uh, because this was not something that I knew as a possibility. First of all, I'm 71. So my childhood was in the 50s. <laughs> I was born in 1952 um, at a time when very when much less was expected or in the future of girls than the future of boys. <laughs> so the notion that I would, or any girl at that time, I grew up in a middle-class family in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and it was not so much, I think, in the 50s and early 60s as I was growing up that that enormous barriers were placed in my way. There was just no expectation that girls would, it was great, it was, it was expected that I would go to college, sure, Um at that point, by that point, girls were going to college, uh, and that I would maybe have some sort of a job, but the notion that I would have to, I should plan for a future in some sort of profession was really not yet there. So again, so I grew up, I was born in 1952. Um, well, th those things changed <laughs> when I became a teenager because the women's movement happened. And so that began when I was in high school um, or really kind of as I was coming out of high school, uh, I graduated from high school in 1970. Um, so just as the women's movement was getting started and I graduated from high school at a time, of course, the Vietnam war, uh, I was the editor of my high school newspaper and was a political activist sort of <laughs> in high school, um, not hugely well i mean i wore a black armband i got thrown out of school because of you know political kind of things but those were anti-war protests at the time but anti-war protests and civil rights protests are, of course part of what's in, what inspired the women's movement uh and so that became something that really shaped me uh from that point on professionally as well as personally was being involved in the women's movement as a very as a young person i mean as a teenager uh, then and and I went to college. Um, thinking about childhood experiences, my father was a mid-level um, manager for Sears Roebuck, which is a large corporation. <laughs> um, was at that point a large corporation uh, of uh, that sold things across the country. And as with many corporations at that point, uh, managers were expected to move around a lot. And they were transferred from one point to another and their family, because, of course, in the 50s, no one expected women to have any uh, kind of position <laughs> that they were attached to. They followed their husbands wherever they were they went so that men were transferred constantly. Um, and I moved around. We moved around a lot as a family until I was about 13 when we finally sort of settled in Minneapolis. So we moved to Chicago for a while. We moved other places for a while. Um, it, and then, and then we kind of settled into one place when I was 12 or 13. So I bounced around a lot and got used to, to, to being in new places um, within new schools and with new groups of friends until I kind of was an adolescent. So I think that, you know, as I look back on this, thinking about childhood experiences, it's that moving a lot. Uh, I was the oldest also, and I have twin brothers who are much younger. So that also, you know, as, as people who study childhood and placement in families and the way that you are, how this shaped you, being oldest and being the oldest girl and being the oldest girl significantly older than twin brothers um, 
or than, than twins had happened, uh, also sort of shaped me. And then I was used to sort of being responsible for people who were much younger than me from an early period of time. I had absolutely, when I was growing up, no desire to be a teacher. And of course, I ended up, I ended up be, being one in some ways. Um, because I think in part because that was one of the professions that were sort of open to women and that women went into at the time. You know, your choices basically were teacher or nurse if you wanted to be a professional a profession at the time. Um, but that changed. I mean, that changed when I was a teenager um, and the women's movement happened. Um, so that I think, again, thinking about my own experiences after that um, was shaped, were shaped by this continually kind of expanding opportunities for women um, and expectations for women that they would then do it all, <laughs> which is what, what we have now. Um, so I don't know if that gets at your question of how did my childhood as it was. Uh, again, I had a very you know, traditional a nuclear family. It was just my dad and my mother and my young, much younger brothers. Uh, we lived in the city of Minneapolis. So I went to a public high school in the city of Minneapolis, but in a nice part of the city and in a nice part of the city. I had a sort of middle class background at that point. And this was a time, this is in the 50s, when a middle class salary of one person my father, in my case, uh, could support a family to what was understood to be a middle-class lifestyle. That's not so true anymore. <laughs> it hasn't been true for quite a while. Um, but that was true then. Uh, so my mother had been a fashion artist, uh, and then she kept on being a fashion artist. So she did uh, art for department stores that appeared in newspapers. She drew shoes and... and uh, um, clothing and other kinds of things in newspapers. And she worked for, for a couple of department stores uh, while I was a young child. And I, my grandparents took care of me. And then when my brothers were born, then she stopped doing that because it was just too complicated um, to move, to to work and to have my brothers as well as me. But I grew I, so I did grow up with kind of one, my mother who had worked uh, during the time when I was a small child. Um, but then by the time that I was sort of aware of kind of what was going on. Then she was no longer working um, and my father was. So that, you know, those were, that was a very kind of stereotypical uh, growing up in the 50s in the United States for a white girl. Um, what you tell is very interesting because uh, the previous guests in this podcast who came from Europe tell that uh, sometimes they were actually the first generation of women to be studying at the university because women simply were not meant to study at university by the standards of the time. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that was clearly, I will say the first time that I went to Germany, um, which was right after, I had a Fulbright right after I graduated from college. Um, so I went there and lived there for the first time uh, when I was 20. And I realized, and of course, after that as well, um, that the women's movement in terms of academia, the women's movement had an impact in the United States long before it had an impact in Germany. And um, German women continued to be, and I would say probably till today, continue to be confronted with things that um, by that point, <laughs> American women academics wouldn't put up with. <laughs> um, so it was a step back <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. But I think it's also because um, you know, academic life in Europe is different than academic life in the United States in that um, people are tracked, maybe a little bit less so now, but not too much. People are tracked into an academic, into going kind of the academic route or the non-academic route much earlier in, certainly in Germany and other parts of Europe as well. Um, whereas in the United States, that doesn't happen quite as strongly, it didn't happen quite as strongly. Um, and there's more sort of a sense of, well, everybody should go to college or something. At least at that point, there was that. But yeah, um, so expectations were, but ex I would certainly agree with that, that expectations were very different for boys and girls um, when I was when I was younger. Um, but that's changed. <laughs> Luckily. Or maybe not. Yeah, now it seems to be, you know, it, and that's what makes everything so threatening. And that's partly why we see this enormous right wing resurgence right now is that guys are scared. <laughs> yeah. You know. Now I'm very curious about the books that you liked as a child. Were those history books or something else? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I can't think of anything. I mean, I read widely and I read all, and I read all kinds of things, but, it, you know, I, even at that time too, books were sort of trapped, you know, there were girls books and there were boys books and just that there were books written for, and, and I think these things, some of this hasn't changed and that it's still both, both authors and movie producers and television producers are trying to figure out how to, how to produce things with a female protagonist, like a girl protagonist that boys will watch or boys, you know, video games that boys will play if the main character is female. I mean, this is still a, still an yeah, issue. Yeah. There were quite a few games that I remember yeah. the teenager yeah. that uh, had yeah. female protagonists in them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Legend of Zelda, <laughs> my kid, my own boys played those games. Um, not because I gave them to them, but, but because they thought that they were fun. Um, but I, you know, so I read... You know, I read books that were designed for girls, you know, all those detective Trixie Belden, which is a detective series for girls way better than Nancy Drew. But then I also read sort of what were perceived to be boys adventure books, you know, um, oh, there's so an that... author like Last of the Mohicans, you know, I mean, this these yeah. kinds of things, you know, for Ticonderoga, um, like the Italian author Raphael Sabatini, who wrote these kind of adventure books that were were designed that mean you know scaramouche and, <laughs> and those kind of things that had had a male kind of swashbuckler in the middle of those and i you know i i read those kind of adventure books that were about a we would say i would say now of course i didn't say it at, when i was 10 and i say it a male protagonist but the you know the the, the middle of the story the, the actor in the story was always a was a man um and so i think that that's you know that that was something that that we, we want to read as a child you want to read about people who do things um you know what we would now call agency they, they have agency but you want to read about people who have exciting lives and at that point the people who had exciting lives were men um or boys so they so you know i read those kind of classic you know like tom sawyer and i mean all of those kind of children's classics that were designed for boy and girl readers um you know, I don't, again, I don't think of myself as having any, I don't remember having any particular interest, unusual interest, say, in history books, or I just read all sorts of stuff. Um, I read widely, and and um, if I was reading just for my own choice, it would kind of be these adventure stories, um, sometimes said in the past, just because there were the, all these, you know, that many of them were, sometimes not, Um then when I was in high school, I continued to sort of read adventure books. And this was sort of at a time when when secret agent books, I mean, when James Bond was really, was really popular. And so there were all these kind of both on television and books, you know, there are all these kind of books about secret agents. Uh, and sometimes there'd be like a woman in them. And, you know, sometimes she would be the act, an active person as well as the romantic interest of the male lead. But but there was just just kind of that. But when I think also of like games that I played with my friends when I was a child or, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, um, we would often play games where we were men. I mean, we were, were we were, you know, like secret agent games. Again, this is this is the height of all of that stuff. Man from uncle and, and these kind of things that were on television. And in order to have a active have have a kind of be active you had to be a guy um and it didn't seem i mean we weren't doing gender bending i mean it was not any we didn't really think of ourselves as kind of a developing a tra <laughs> transfer it was just like oh okay well if you wanted to do something exciting and imagine yourself in an exciting life um that had to be a man and so you just we just played but the, you know the same thing would have been um earlier on for people i think who played cops you know they play cops and robbers or they played, I wasn't very interested in the whole Western thing. There were certainly boys in my neighborhood who played Cowboys and Indians. Um, it was, that was just not something that, that interested me. Um, but secret agents was, it was something that, you know, and that was a kind of group of girls in our neighborhood that we'll get when, when we were eight, nine, uh, would play that. Um, what about Hollywood stars? Did you see them as role models? No, you know, um, again, I'm trying to think back before the, the beginning the kind of beginning of the of the women's movement and yeah i guess i wouldn't say stars as the individual but the character I and mean, it wasn't interested i wasn't interested or we weren't interested in this my group of friends with in like the life celebrities the way there are first of all the access to it wasn't like it is now you would have to get some sort of magazine at the grocery store that your mother would have to buy for you 
um, if you wanted to really know about this stuff, you couldn't just flick on your computer and your phone and look at it. And, you know, you weren't, we weren't saturated with celebrity culture. Um, so that, that what I think many children then also, they'd watch a television show or watch a movie, and then they would play sort of the characters in that movie. Um, whether it was, uh, it was cops, you know, sort of a cop show that we were watching or, you know, a, secret agent show that we were watching or people who like to play kind of Westerns, although that was sort of passe by the time I was, I was, there was something maybe younger children did. Um, and I was also at the very end um, or at, at sort of at the end of my doll playing years came Barbie. <laughs> so I was kind of in the first, having just seen the Barbie movie this, this summer with a young, much younger friend of mine. Um, you know, that that was something, uh, dolls were not a very, a terribly important part of my life that I grew up. I mean, I can't remember very much playing with them, but I had Barbies at the end. But if she, came, she came in right when I was sort of moving out of playing with dolls, but I certainly had them. Um, and mostly I remember making clothes for her because uh, I like to sew. And so it was like, oh, you could make these, you could design and make clothes for this this doll. Um, and but that was not, it, it was, again, it was kind of, she was a little bit, I was a little bit too old for having kind of glommed onto Barbie right away, the way that many other girls did. Um, there it was. It's very interesting uh, to, to know about uh, this kind of childhood in the 50s, because yeah, it's quite distant time from now. And especially for younger people who might be listening to us, it should be very interesting to know how it was <laughs> in the past times. But then I wonder, when did your interest in history sparkle? Was it around uh, that time of your childhood? But you mentioned that books, for example, were not uh, particularly historical. Or was it at school or was it after school that you realized that history might be something that you are interested in? Well, I mean, I had a good history teacher in high school. Um, and I mean, I was a smart girl in high, in high school, a high school intellectual um, and that type, if you know that type. And I think most people, many people do. Um, and I had a, so I was in, within my school, uh, within many U.S. schools, there were tracks, although not as much as in Germany. And so I was sort of tracked into like advanced classes and and uh, enriched classes and such like that. And the, the man, Mr. Hansen, uh, Mike Hansen, who I had all through high school as my history teacher um i mean that was that was a good so we used college books and we do that and that was that was he was a good teacher um and uh and i liked them but i was again at that point i was more thinking i was going to be an english major uh the english teachers in my high school were way cooler than any <laughs> than the like they were they were young a couple of them and again this, so i'm in high school this is the late 60s by the time i'm in high school so I was in high school. Um, so being cool was really important. Uh, and they were. So I thought, okay, what I want to do is go on to college and, and be an English major and go on and be um, be a newspaper editor. That was my plan um, if I had one. But then uh, I, I went to this small college, Grinnell College in Iowa. And my first semester there, um, one in a college I were a liberal arts college where you had to take all kinds of things that were you had to take a wide range of things. Um, I took a couple my first year. I took a couple of history courses uh, because I thought, oh, this would be interesting. And the history department there was known to be good. I also kept on taking English um, and a bunch of other things. And I ran into. Um, two really excellent instructors uh, there, including Philip Kintner, who was a historian of 16th century South Germany, <laughs> the little town of Mammingen. Uh, so a historian of the Reform and the Reformation in Mammingen. And that he's the one that uh, made me decide that I, uh, I should switch from my intent to be an English major to being a history major, um, because I was just so interested in this stuff, not, not thinking of it, however, vocationally at that point. Again, I grew up, I'd never met a college professor until I had them, my, <laughs> had them myself. So I, I, I didn't know anyone whose parents were this, had this as an occupation. It didn't really occur to me that one could do this. Um, and it didn't really occur to me to begin with when I became a hit, when I first started to take history classes and became a history major, because this again, this is the late 60s. Um, 
most people who were history majors uh, were planning on going to law school. <laughs> that was what you were going to do. You know, like, what would you do? So if you went home for a holiday and talked to your family or your friends or family's friends or something, and they said, oh, and you said, oh, I'm going to be a major history. Well, the question is, well, what are you going to do with that? Well, you go, I'm going to go to law school. Um, it is still because, the same question that people are. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Why, why are you doing that? Right. <laughs> um, so that was also my plan was that I was going to, I thought, oh, well, if I, I mean, if I had a plan, um, I was going to get a history major and then I was going to go to law school. And I thought, okay, that's, that's what I'm going to do with this history major because I was, had gotten interested in it. But because I was interested in, uh, in what Phil Kentner was teaching, I thought, oh, maybe I would, you couldn't really, at my little college, you couldn't really specialize in history of any particular, you just took it widely. So I took everything, you know, American constitutional history and some Chinese history and all a variety of different things. Um, but then um, when I was planning to graduate, I thought, well, I'll take the exams that are called LSATs in the United States that you have to take to, to go on to law school. And I'll also take the GREs, which are the exams to go on to graduate school, because I didn't really still quite know what I wanted to do. Um, I did fine in both. I take tests really, really well. Um, I'll just be, can brag about that. I'm a really good test taker. Um, <laughs> and so I did fine in both of them. And I applied to both of them. And then, I mean, into graduate school, history graduate school. And um in law school and i also applied for a fulbright fellowship um and i got into law schools and i got into grad schools and i got the fulbright and i also got a scholarship to go to history graduate school from the university of wisconsin madison like a full scholarship and my family was not wealthy so the notion that i could go on to school and not pay anything <laughs> was very attractive. Um, and then the fact that I got this Fulbright, which took me to Europe, to Germany for the first time for living, to live in Germany for a year uh, to study at the University of Würzburg um, in history, as graduate school in history. Um, that sort of set me on this path to say, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to go to graduate school in history. You're not going to law school. You know, and I wish I could say to young people, oh, I had this really clear idea about what I wanted to do from the time that I was a small child. And no, I mean, it was just, again, this is not something that that I knew. It was not a world that I knew very much about. But where I had gone to college, I, you know, I sort of saw the life that people who were faculty there lived. And I thought, well, that's an attractive kind of life. Um, a more kind of life of the mind and where you, you're not in a job from nine to five where you don't have to wear stockings and you can still be a professional <laughs> is a big thing to me. It would be the sort of the female equivalent of the tie at that point. Um, in other words, you could be taken seriously, but, st but still have quite a lot of freedom in your work life where you didn't have to be in an office all the time. Um, and that was a, that was kind of, a, that was appealing to me. And then I was also becoming increasingly interested through the influence of Phil Kintner, increasingly interested in the 16th century. Um, as a time of enormous change in in the the world of Europe uh, and the world as a whole, um, so uh, so I went off to Würzburg <laughs> for a year. Um, Würzburg is a very Catholic city. I don't know if you know Würzburg. It's sort of a funny place for someone who ended up working a lot on the Protestant Reformation <laughs> to encounter German culture for the first time. Um, but you know, it's a prince bishopric. It's very baroque. Um, I decided Baroque was not my art style um, <laughs> after seeing a lot of it there. Uh, but, it, you know, it that year in Würzburg firmed up my German. I mean, my German was much better by the time I went to the university there. Uh, my German was fine by the, or much better by the time I came back than I'd been before I went. Um, and then set me on a, path, you know, uh, sort of a path to graduate school where, where I then went. It seems to me that what you describe is very different from the experience that uh, a lot of people nowadays actually have. And this is because uh, a lot of uh, the researchers and scholars to whom I spoke in this podcast told me that they had to plan their career. And those who said that it went spontaneously didn't always go very smoothly. So I wonder if at this stage you were thinking already 
uh, what you're going to do and how your career would develop if you made any special effort in order to achieve your goals? Yeah. Um, well, again, because I had sort of come into this decision or made this decision more, for, again, more for financial reasons than anything, because I could go to Madison. I mean, I got and accepted a, a range of grad schools, but Madison gave me a full scholarship. Um, you, you, this is the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, and the person who was the Reformation historian at Madison, um, Robert Kingdon, you know, as I have advised younger students over the decades now about choosing a graduate school uh, and deciding where you're going to go um, to graduate school, you know, I say over and over and over to them that the, your relationship with your Dr. Fata, you know, with your graduate advisor, with your PhD advisor, yeah. is going to be something that will follow you the rest of your life um, for good or ill. So you should really make sure that this is a person you can get along with. Um, I mean, you don't have to be close buddies, but you have to respect them. They have you have to feel that they respect you. Um, you have to be relatively happy, and you're and you're going to be at graduate school for a long time. <laughs> so don't go to a place you hate. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes people say, "Oh, I had," um, you know, if you don't like hot weather, don't you know? <laughs> I mean, don't go to you know. Be sure to when you're when you're trying to choose a graduate school, go to visit the places, even if it costs you money, go to visit them, talk to students who are there, see if you can imagine yourself being in this place. Um, talk as much as you can to your advisor, the person you want to be your advisor, to other people that that person has had as students, um, you know, try to get a, as good a sense as possible. I mean, it still might be wrong and you might have to change, but that's really hard to do. Um, you know, and, but that person who's your advisor, will need to be your champion to some degree because if you want a job they're going to you know they're going to be the most important person for you for a long time um you know even 20 years later uh so i think that and i was very fortunate in that um when i was kind of ca casting around for for places to go uh, and i did visit places and went to Madison. And again, Madison, Wisconsin is not that much different from Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's a place where there's significant winter, <laughs> you know, I mean, it just, um, you know, I like Madison as a city to be in, as a place to be in. And I, the history department, the UW Madison history department at that point was gigantic. Um, it had several hundred graduate students. Um, this is in the early, so you can't imagine it now. It had several hundred graduate students. It had, it had 60 some faculty, but Here's a dramatic difference. Of the 60, I don't know, 65, let's say 65 faculty at that point, two of them were female. Two. <laughs> two out of 65. Yeah. You know, and that my my undergraduate department, which had been nine people at Grinnell College, not a woman in them. Um, I mean, this is really for people that, you know, people want to know, well, what's the big difference? Okay, there we go. Two out of 65. And in 1970, people were beginning to think, huh, maybe there might be something wrong with that. Uh, yes, indeed. It uh, took quite some time for people to understand that there was indeed something wrong with that. You mentioned that there were only two women out of 65 staff members at your department. And you also mentioned that it was the time of change. So I wonder if you've seen that change and if you could tell a little bit more about that change. Well, um, <laughs> they changed slowly. And they changed because because of the, of the women's movement. Um, again, I think that for younger people, it's it's hard to imagine how. And they sort of look at us I mean, again. I'm seventy one now. Oh, you know, weren't you totally outraged? And how could he? Well, yes, but we had to kind of come to our outrage because until relatively shortly before then, you know, in many places, women were simply not allowed in graduate school at all, or there were quotas. And when we say a quota in the 50s or earlier, and even into the 60s in many places, a quota didn't mean a minimum number of women, it meant a maximum number of women. Like we didn't, because there was this sense that, well, why would you let places in graduate schools go to women because they're not going to become faculty, they're not going to become professors because they're just going to go off and get married. And so, um, you know, so I think that this, uh, this, this, um, that change was kind of beginning to happen, uh, but it was slow. Um, and for partic particularly in a place like academia, where there's an enormously long pipeline for people to 
come into it in order to have female professors or female faculty, whatever, any rank, you know, you have to have female graduate students, which means you have to have girls when they're undergraduates, young women when they're undergraduates, think about going to graduate school, which means, you know, so it, it's, a, it, you know, this is not something that can happen overnight. You can't just say, okay, well, we're going to do this. And the same things happen with other professions, you know, medical doctors and law and, and other things like that. So, so that the, the opening up to women um, and to other groups as well has happens from the bottom up. Um, and the very last places for that any kind of reasonable number of, of, of people to become, you know, part of the, of the, the, the group is, is the very top. And of course, in many, most, many things that, that hasn't happened yet. If you look at full professors, CEOs, I mean, all of those kinds of things. Um, so anyway, but, so I went to graduate school. Um, I started there in, in, in Madison, um, in 1974, um, after my year in Germany. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this is the middle, this is the women's, this is the height of the women's movement. And so I was also very involved as a graduate student. I was in, I was involved in women's groups in the city, women's transit, which is a ride service for women and other kinds of women's groups and other sorts of protest stuff that was going on. So I was involved politically in things as well as organizing for the teaching assistants. We were doing that at the same time because we wanted to have a union, um, which happened later. Um and I was also, uh, this is at the same time, uh, of course, and they're not, they're directly related to one another, um, that women's history is beginning to become an academic field. Um, and these are, it is not, it is, of course, directly related to the fact that more women are coming into the field of history. You know, I remember saying that at one point some while ago in some talk I was giving about the relationship between the growth of women's history and the entry of women into the field. And somebody, some guy said, Oh, don't you think that's kind of sliding it? And was it kind of like, I said, no, it's totally understandable. Um, gee, we want to, you know, most of us kind of are somewhat interested in people in the past that we feel have some kind of vague relationship to ourselves. I mean, we're all kind of, <laughs> you know, um, egotistical that way. For some people, that's not true, and they get very, very interested in things that they that are really very distinct from themselves. But for lots of us, it's kind of like, oh, we we kind of want to know how we or and the people around us got to be the way they are. Um, so how did things get? To, I mean, that's if, that's why we're interested in history in the first place. Is that's our answer to the question of why are things the way they are? Um, you know, my younger son is a geneticist; he's a scientist, and. He, He's interested also in why are things the way they are, but he's interested in genetics, and, and which is another way to answer that question, right? So, I mean, biologists can answer it, anthropologists can answer it, religious scholars can answer it. For historians, our answer, we're interested in history because we're interested in, in we think, I think, that that's an answer to why are things the way they are, um, that the answer can be found in history or partly found in history. Um, and it, it, so to me, that was, it was completely uh I got very interested at the very same time then in in look at, in women's history as a field. Um, my advisor was a man. <laughs> was a man <laughs> um, because most people, at, you know, the vast all well, sixty three out of the sixty five people at, Mad at people faculty at Madison were were men. Um, but he was very he was a person who was and said we was a we were a good fit because he was a person who was very willing to let his students do what they wanted to do for their research. This is not true of all faculty <laughs> um, whose students do or are expected to do what they decided. Well, that Bob was not that way at all. So he thought it was kind of interesting that I first wanted to do a master's thesis and then a doctoral dissertation about women. Um, later on, as women's history became a really important field at UW-Madison, um, he took great pride in saying that the first graduate seminar in women's history was in fact his because he always, and this is a, a, I think a good mark of the way, way he was in as, as an advisor, his graduate seminars were always the Reformation and something, you know, kind of topical. And they usually were the Reformation and 
whatever the graduate student who had just come back from the archives was focusing on. So one year, so we had, there was a student working on printers. One year, his grad seminar was the Reformation and printing. One year, it was, you know, I mean, there were always something like that. Um, one year, it was the Reformation in the cities. I came back from the archives and I did my archival research in Nuremberg, uh, which was a Protestant city. Um, and I came back from doing my archival research and was starting to write my dissertation. So that year, his seminar was on the Reformation and women, because uh, I wrote my dissertation on working women in Nuremberg um, and uh, in the 16th century or 15th through 17th centuries. So he had, you know, that's the, so I kind of co-taught his, his seminar on, on women. This is really, again, this is very early. Um, so in fact, there, there was nobody there was a part-time person who was doing women's history at that time and another part-time person doing some U.S. women's history. Um, but his was a, then later on, he took very great pride in that. Um, so he was a, a good advisor and he let me be, uh, he just let me do kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, and I went then to Nuremberg for my dissertation research uh, where there had been a fair number of historians, U.S. historians, of the 16th century, mostly from Ohio State, because the person there, Harold Grimm, had been a Nuremberg person. But it, they were willing to, to tolerate me, and the archivists in Nuremberg were very nice folks, um, were used to Americans, kind of, which is another bridge to cross. <laughs> um, they weren't so used to women, uh, I will say that. And I, you know, over the years, ran into archivists in Germany. Um, some of whom are fabulous and some of whom just really couldn't kind of deal with women historians and some, and, and, or historians of women. And they just, you know, <laughs> I remember once an archivist in Ulm, because uh, when I finished my dissertation on working women in Nuremberg, and then I got a job and then I went, was going to turn my dissertation into a book as one does. Um, I decided I didn't want to do just Nuremberg uh, I just wanted to make it a little broader or broader. So I went back to Germany a couple of times to different archives in different cities, South German cities. And I ended up writing this, my first book on working women in, in Renaissance Germany that looks at six different cities, Nuremberg, one of them, and then five other places to try to see, you know, I couldn't really tell at that point whether what I'd found for Nuremberg is just Nuremberg or is it, which has its own distinctive economy and such, or is it more broadly across South Germany? So I went back to five other places and, um, and I was <laughs> just recently recalling an archivist in Ulm who, when I went in, which is the last of my six cities, I went in and talked to the archivist and said, this is what I'm working on. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to use your sources. I mean, you have to introduce yourself as a, as a researcher into the archivist. I had my letters of introduction with all their stamps on them, but, <laughs> but you have to personally introduce yourself as well. Um, and he said to me, Oh, you won't. I said I'm working at working women and in 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 the 16th century. Um, and he said, "Oh, you won't find any sources here about that because women didn't work in Ulm in the 16th century." So I didn't laugh. I, I said, "Thank you very much. Let, let me just talk to your reading room staff." So then I went to the reading room staff, who were really nice people, and said, "I want to see these things, which I knew from my other five cities I'd already been in would have tons of stuff on working women, and of course they did." Um, so. Lots of women worked in all of the 16th century, like they all did, basically. Um, but it was at that point, this is again, sort of mid-70s, you know, by this point, it's uh, mid-70s early. So uh, people were, they really sort of thought of working women as a brand new thing, the sort of view that in the past women hadn't worked. It had been this kind of nuclear family with the father working, you know, a male breadwinner. It was in their head still, and they didn't understand it. <laughs> about the economy yeah yeah recently i was teaching the... <clears throat> sorry recently i was teaching this topic and uh, i was discussing with my students what options women had in the early modern period yeah and they said but women didn't work <laughs> and one of them said well how can you say that the others they were yeah. at home that was also work and they were very much surprised by reading your book and uh, the Wonders book. Yeah. In fact, when we were working, of course, they were working. And yeah. Obviously yeah. that they were, but the notion that they weren't is still there, even yeah. almost years later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I must say that what you're saying is very interesting. And I wonder 
what happened next? Once you finish the dissertation, what steps did you undertake in order to ensure a continuation? Okay. Um, so I finished my dissertation at yet another terrible point in the in the job market. Not as bad as today, but pretty awful. I was fortunate to get a job at a small college, Augustana College, uh, in Northern Illinois. And I think basically the two jobs that I had, so I worked at Augustana College for six years, and then I moved to the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, where I stayed for 30 some years. Um, and in both cases, I got the job, I could say, oh, because I was the most worthy candidate. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but part, um, I think, because the chair of the search committee in both places was the father of daughters. And I know for sure in the case, when I got the job at UW Milwaukee, I know this is true because he later told me this. Um, and I, I suspect this is also true at Augustana that they realized may, probably without thinking about it a lot, you know, like without it being foremost in their mind, that if they didn't give women a chance, what were their daughter's lives? You know, what would be their, the opportunities for their daughters? Um, so, okay. So I, anyway, I went, to, I, I got a job and I was very fortunate to have that uh, because it was a bad time for the, for jobs at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, where I was a quarter of the history department. <laughs> there were four of us in history. So I taught everything, uh, all of European history, as, as we said at that point, Neanderthal and Nazis, um, as we would say now, Paleolithic to Putin. Um, <laughs> that's kind of what we do. So I taught all of European history. I taught American women's history because I was a woman and therefore I could teach American women's history, though I hadn't had any American history in graduate school at all. Uh, I, but like, okay, that's fine. I could put I could put that together. And and when you're teaching a small place, you you teach lots of things you don't know very much about because you can't know it all. You know, I taught suddenly I was teaching the Roman Empire. I mean, I never had any classical history in my life, and so. So I taught there and I taught a wide variety, you know, I taught all kinds of European history courses, um, not very much modern European history. We sometimes brought in somebody to teach that, but I taught medieval regularly. I taught the Renaissance and Reformation. I taught women's history, um, European women's history. I introduced a course in that. I taught some history theory and historiography, you know, the, the wide variety of courses that one teaches at a small college, you know, and it was a good place to be. Uh, it meant that Throughout my career, when and would have it later, when I suddenly had to teach something I didn't know very much about, I had already done it, and it, it didn't scare me. Um, and these things happen sometimes uh, for one reason or another. Some colleague gets sick, and you have to fill in, or something else happens, and you suddenly have to teach stuff you don't know very much about. So, so I taught there for six years, um, and then I moved to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee which at that point was a department of about of about 25 people. So there were five of us in European history instead of just me. <laughs> I could specialize more closely in Renaissance and Reformation and early modern. I still taught women's history, European women's history, you know, kind of the whole run of it from Greece to now. And I taught history theory, historiography and pedagogy and writing courses and a variety of other other courses there. I also taught both at Augustana and at UW Milwaukee. I taught the basic Western Civ Western Civilization survey course, which is a standard survey in the United States at that point. It's a basic kind of European history with some classical history thrown in too. Um, very common, common kind of course. And I kept teaching that until the very late 90s um, when I, I became increasingly interested in, and what was also happening in general, was the kind of rise of world history as a, at least a teaching field and also a research field. So for me, about the same, at about the same time, my teaching and my research broadened to become more world global history than just European history anymore. I stopped teaching world history, Western Civ and started teaching world history. Uh, <laughs> In fact, the first semester that we taught, a colleague of mine who was a modern did who taught modern China, and I put together a world history survey, and I taught the first half, and he taught the second half. <clears throat> and the first semester that we taught that, so the first semester world history was taught at UW Milwaukee, 
And I switched partly because I looked out at my class students and I said, they're not all from Europe. And this, this is not teaching Western Civ is not their history. And so I wanted something that was more relevant and I was becoming more interested in myself anyway. <laughs> and the first semester that I taught it was the fall semester of 2001. And the first day that I taught it was September 4th, 2001. Okay. You know what that day means. So, <laughs> so the first day I taught it, I did this little song and dance about why we all need to know something about world history and why we were switch adding world history onto this and why we were doing this. So, you know, it's kind of this justification for this brand new course, la, la, la. You know, a week later, <laughs> when you're trying to teach, I mean, we didn't, you know, you just sort of had, everybody was gathered around television sets staring at, at the World Trade Center. Suddenly my course in world history, which had a unit on, the Crusades, um, about which had students reading Muslim views of the Crusades and Christian views of the Crusades already planned, planned. And it was like, okay, do I need to explain why we should know something about this stuff? Um, so it was a really dramatic semester to be to teach at all, um, to do anything. Um, but it was a really dramatic semester to be doing the teaching the first world history course at UW Milwaukee because it, it was right there. I mean, the history, this history was now what was happening. So that was, you know, I try, I sort of describe when I think about my own intellectual trajectory, I describe that, I mean, the kind of switch in the late 90s to around 2000 or so, both in research and in teaching as my conversion experience that I have had a global perspective on everything I do since. Now, I still do European history. Um, I still write European history. Uh, but if you know that that both my kind of main textbooks, early modern Europe and early modern women, they have a global part to them. Um, they're Europe and the world. I also write stuff in world history a lot. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that's it's that's a, a change that, that has happened uh, in my own teaching and research and in the field in general. Um, I think this is not I was not alone in saying continue to teach Western Civ as if it were the experience of the whole world is not right. <laughs> and it's not. And so, and that's where I think having had this experience at Augustana of teaching all kinds of stuff I don't know anything about or much about was also very helpful. When you become a world historian, mostly what you teach is stuff you know nothing about or know very little about. Um, <laughs> so you just have to, you you know, you have to be confident of yourself to be able to help students ask the right questions and have them help them find out where to look if they want answers to things. Um, there's the other part of my trajectory was coming, becoming, moving from being a historian of Europe to being a global or world historian, um, which I did. What I find interesting personally in your academic work is that uh, you managed to navigate the interesting but also complicated concepts such as uh, gender in your work in such a way that uh, they become accessible and understandable also by the very young students. And uh, I have example of my own students who read your text and they also read text, for example, of Judith Butler, who is far more theoretical than you are. And they said, oh, we cannot really understand Butler at all, even if we read it and if you read it carefully, but we can understand what Mary Wisner Hanks writes because she's so clear and articulates her ideas in a very clear manner. Could you comment a little bit about that? <laughs> well, I don't understand Butler sometimes either. So you can console your students that um, <laughs> that it's it's hard for people who 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 are professionals too. You know, I think there was a, and I'm putting it in the past tense now. But but I was writing a back of it. First of all. I have written for students for a really long time at, at all levels. I wrote, I've written books for middle school students. I mean, student, you know, young people who are 12 and 13 years old. I've written lots of books for design with my audience when I'm writing, like when early modern Europe or early modern women. I mean, my audience is undergraduates, upper level under. So I have to write that way for them. I'm writing, and there's no point to write for your audience and have them not understand it. So Judith Butler is not writing for undergraduates. Um, and sometimes poor undergraduates are made to read her, but she's not writing for, or, and people who write in that kind of more theoretical mode um, are not writing for undergraduates. So partly it's a different, it's a different in audience um, in, in that. Um, and I started writing for undergraduates quite early on in my career when somebody asked me about what I work on this, on, a, on my first book for classroom use. 
um, my first book, Working Women, was out. And I, I was also at that point um, pregnant. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I'm not going to, because your own life intervenes with what how shapes your world <laughs> too. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not going back to archives probably for a while now um, because I'll have an infant and that gets complicated. And so maybe I should, someone asked me to write a book for classroom use. And I thought, yeah, I'll see if I like that. And then, um, and it would fit into my own life cycle at this point uh, too. And then I really like it. And so I really like writing for, with a student audience in mind, um, or at least partly in mind. So that's how I write, which means it's more concrete and less theory. But, (laughs) but that said, then what, what happened is I was writing those kind of, I was writing books for undergraduates during the middle of the, during the cultural turn of the eighties, which is when that stuff started to come out. Um, and, uh, and I had to try to, <laughs> to, um, and you'll sometimes see this in introductions to, um, on, to like when women and gender, to try to think about how can I explain this more cultural uh, gender theory in a way that an undergraduate can understand. So I've had to, to try to think, you know, understand it myself and then explain it in terms that are a bit more concrete and a little less kind of theor- theoretical. Um, but, and and I think that was partly, I mean, when women's history first started, meaning back in the seventies, what the theory that was in women's history at that point came from the social sciences. It kind of came from anthropology and sociology and Marxism and stuff. It came from that kind of, so that was, it was more social science-y kind of theory, which has its own kind of theory. Um, And then in the eighties, there was a cultural turn in history in general, and you got this kind of more cultural theory in which gender theory was a really important part. Um, and the language got uh, got to be a different kind of obscurity than the language of social science obscurity it tends to be quantifiable and you have to understand about chi-square analysis. I mean, and I could kind of do that because I used to do economic history. Um, so that's one kind of one kind of jargon. I mean, there's economic history jargon if you kind of come out of that, and you have to know how to do that. Every field has its sort of jargon, um, and and then there was sort of cult, the kind of cultural history, the cultural turn, uh, and, and the whole sort of thing about gender is socially constructed, and you know, and these were you know now things that people think of as kind of basic where you start. Um, those are things that in the 70s and 80s had to be proved. I mean, now if you say to students, well, gender socially constructed, well, they say, duh, you can see it on a YouTube video or on TikTok. I mean, how, you wouldn't watch people construct gender in t- on their TikTok videos. They know this by the time they're 10. Um, that was a new idea in the 80s. And people went, oh, no, it isn't. It's all about, you know. Um, so I think to me, it's interesting how things that start out being kind of really radical suddenly become self-evident by about 30 years later. And that's one of them, the gender is socially constructed. You know, and then sort of pick people picked it apart and said, you know, there isn't a firm line between gender and sex and, you know, like biological sex, cultural gender, that's not firm. You know, people, but but that's it. So so I think partly is to when, to console your students, partly is it's it's if it's older Butler and she writes now, she's not writing about that quite that anymore. But it's, if it's in the 80s, that was a moment of women's studies kind of becoming way very interested by literary theory, uh, post-structuralism and other kinds of French literary theory. That's all very written very in a very obscure way um, to my way, way of thinking. So it was kind of feeling like, well, if we're going to be taken seriously, we have to write in this particular way. There's been, I would say now uh, within the last couple of decades, almost um, certainly since 2010 or so, there's been a kind of moving away from that, kind of theory theoretical language because it's not, it's off-putting um so i'm just finishing up now editing the cambridge world history of sexualities with matt kiefler um we're doing the final copy edits now um which is a project about a, it's a project that's taken about five years and that is really pale to, to putin i mean it's but it's sexuality it's not gender and even the chapters I was thinking about this, even the chapters that are the more kind of theoretical chapters um, really are not written in that, that kind of jargonese of the eighties, thank heaven. Um, so that even, 
and many of the people who are cited in it and some of the authors who write in it who are older people, I mean, people my age, my generation, um, they used to write that way and, and they're writing much in much more clearly now. Um, so I think there's been a move away from that, even among people who write kind of theor- theoretically. But for a while it was just rampant <laughs> and you sort of had to feel like you had to write that way. And it was... Uh, and now I look back at that stuff and say, it's, it, it seems very, whenever I see a piece, and I'm the editor of the 16th Century Journal, um, have been for a long time, um, and I see a, a, a submission that comes in and it's still kind of written in this is this, this heavy theory, and it seems very old-fashioned um, to me now, because that's the way we wrote in the 80s, and it's not the way that we write today Um I mean, you know, there still is more theoretical. There's, there's history and theory, and there's journals that. Have, but and I, you know, I will say that to a, a, the author in the submission, saying, "Well, we don't, you know, like nicely. I don't, <laughs> but, but that's not the way that uh, that we need to." So, so I don't think. Um, I think that, that that's partly, and, and also I'd say too, Judith Butler's not a historian, uh, and. Um, you know, she's a philosopher uh, and comes from the literary, the literary critic. She's a philosopher and a literary critic. Uh, and I think for historians that is training and our training of, in, in historians is that what we're doing is we're, we're still at base telling stories. I mean, we're, we're, um, we're telling, we're, we're, te- we're telling stories. Um, we, you know, we start kind of with a question. We go to the sources with our question. Um that we're asking uh, or our idea about things and we, we find information about it. We go to sources, written sources, visual sources, how, whatever we're looking at, um, you know, and then we come out of the sort of that and we tell the story about what, what it is. Uh, so I think in part, there's, there's a, a, a difference in feel that that's what historians do. Yeah. I, I'm writing right now also besides this, uh, Cambridge World History of Sexuality is what I'm editing. I'm writing a book for general readers, um, not a class book, which is yet a different kind of audience. And so, um, and that's really, it's really story, especially history written for general readers is really story driven. Um, I mean, that's why general read, I mean, people are non-academics and non-students. I mean, they read biography more often than they write history because they really like stories about people. Um and I don't mean to trivialize by saying stories. I don't mean I don't mean fake or not. You know, I just but we like to people like to read about people. People. Thank you very very much for this. <laughs> I think fascinating conversation, and uh, for your insights uh, not only on your own life but also on uh, the state of women history and gender history. <laughs>